On this episode of SSI Executive Conversations, Darwin meets with Jeff Brown, former COO of Endologix and GM at J&J and Boston Scientific. They discuss the emergence of digital optimization and AI in medtech, supply chain risk related to global conflicts, and the quadruple win for your business. I'm extremely excited to uh, welcome you, Jeff. Jeff Brown, onto the SSI Executive Conversations podcast series. Uh, I've known Jeff for a few years now and um, an incredible executive and leader. Um, I remember the first time that I had the opportunity to interact with you and understand a little bit about your past successes and accomplishments and how impressed I was with uh, the outcomes and what you've done. But Jeff is an award-winning MedTech COO, um, literally uh, has won, uh, won an award for that in 2021. Uh, leading high growth and major transformations across operations, supply chain, and and really entire multi-site divisions to exceed goals. I know, Jeff, you have that roll up your sleeves, business transformation focus within MedTech. Your expertise has benefited firms anywhere from you know, 30 million up to over $5 billion uh, in revenue. So, Really excited for you to be, uh, be, your willingness to come on and share your experience and expertise with our following. So wel- welcome on to the podcast. Yeah, thank you, Darwin. It's really exciting to be here with you guys. So uh, thank you for having me. Absolutely. Well, let's let's jump right into um, a topic I was really excited to talk to you about. Certainly when it comes to the pandemic, the pandemic has disrupted in so many different areas. And Every one of those areas, your experience, you know, has been involved in and touched. Uh, so supply chain operations, et cetera. Digital optimization is everywhere. Mm-hmm. It's on the mind of, you know, regulatory, uh, getting products across more efficiently, risk re- relevant to virtual twins, manufacturing, right? Smart factories, CFOs. It's the number one thing in the hospital systems that they're thinking about right now according to Becker's spine survey at the beginning of the year. So would you kind of start us off thinking about how things have changed in the pandemic and how artificial intelligence is starting to impact that and digital optimization and maybe speak a little bit from your experience to that to that rate of change? Yeah, so maybe we'll just talk about the elephant in the room right off the bat, uh, chat GPT and some of these large language models. Um, these are all the rage right now, right? And, yes. um, it, and it's funny because they haven't been with us very long. I think they were launched back in October, maybe. So this is a technology that has truly been with us for just a smidgen of time, Mm -hmm. Um, yet it has taken over. Uh, It's affecting earnings calls from various companies. It's it's affecting industries, multiple industries, um, in many, many different ways. And in many cases, we don't even understand the full impact within all of our businesses that these uh, AI and large language models can have but they can have a profound impact. And so um, rate of change, I think, is just an amazing thing to think about, first and foremost. So the rate of change that we're seeing with AI is unlike anything that we've ever seen before. It's far faster than uh, when computers were introduced. It's far faster than the internet when it came out. It's far faster than smartphones and even social media. So the rate of change with AI is unbelievable. I was just listening to some VCs the other day, and they were talking about the level of interest in investing in startup businesses that are based on AI or have AI technologies embedded in them. However, it is such a moving target, it's unbelievable. In other words, companies, startups are actually gaining capital, and then in a week, sometimes one week, two weeks later, their technology is rendered obsolete and has been completely replaced. And so this actually has thrown the investment world a little bit into a tizzy because they want to invest in AI, they want to invest in the next Google, Facebook, or what have you. The problem becomes in one week, maybe two, your entire investment can be obsolete. And so the, the rate of change is unbelievable. But Um, In many cases, what companies are doing right now is they're doing some experimentation, right? And they're asking their employees to start building their awareness of using these tools, using these tools in their everyday applications. What this is intended to do, at least in this phase, 
sort of early phase of AI introduction is to help make existing workforces more effective and more efficient, right? Be able to multiply the effect that any one of us might have by leveraging these tools. Later on, I think there may be a second and third phase where things might change and get a little bit more, uh, more than just an enhancement uh, tool. It might actually be a replacement tool for you know some large chunks of um, of our staffs, uh, depending on the uh, the industry and the in, in the company, of course. So AI has just been uh, an exciting, but also sort of a crazy new development um, in the uh, digital optimization space. There are so many things, and I want to get your follow up insights on on a couple of things that you said there. But for me, everything that you just said was. A that's right moment and certainly a part of the world that I'm seeing and interacting with. Uh, what you just talked about, about different layers. Um, there, so, so multiple things. First of all, the presentation that I had the opportunity to be involved with to, to share with Greenlight Gurus following on Monday. So one of the aspects tied into digital optimization comes from uh, a group that uh, brings value there. And within that data, there were several certain points, but one of the things they talked about is that there's essentially for a company to embrace digital optimization and create efficiencies. There's sort of four steps just for a company to do mm -hmm. that, right? To get to what you would even deem optimal. So I think that speaks really well to what you're talking about in terms of the overall industry. Um, secondly, the uh, I, I, I don't know if you're familiar with Christopher Lafayette's name, but he... I should get a dollar every time I say his name or something lately. But, he, you know, he speaks on the metaverse and how artificial intelligence is the center of the metaverse and everything is changing. He was the keynote speaker at the uh, Medical Device and Manufacturing Conference in Anaheim. And he literally said on the stage that within the next um, eight to 24 months, because what is in R&D that nobody knows about relevant to AI would just absolutely blow everybody's mind. Mm -hmm. And people, executives making decisions to be very careful because they could invest millions of dollars and mm -hmm. with, within six to eight months, what they just bought would be obsolete. So to your point. And then lastly, I have to throw out something G on the GTP because sometimes I feel like, you know, I'm in the middle. I learn all these things and I feel like I, 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 I'd like to think I'm somewhat progressive. And then every time I turn around, I'm like, am I living in a cave? Because with <laughs> chat GTP... I don't, I really barely knew what it was six months ago. And so I was a part of a, of a, of a uh, workshop presentation within the last month uh, on that. And I literally felt like the, the, the closest I could explain it on how blown away I was, was a few moons ago and I had dial up internet at home, right? <laughs> you know, you feel like you're, you're probably ready for your next birthday by the time you actually get on the internet. And then the company I worked for, I went in and they got high speed internet at the office. And I was like, holy cow. So that's kind of how it felt um, because we're starting on the operational side and efficiency. We will be here at SSI integrating that into our processes because the efficiency is just insane. I think mm -hmm. It, we're going to have to be really careful, generally speaking, in, in the world. The first thing I did was go to my 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 son, who's a pilot and finishing up his bachelor's and my soon to be you know freshman in high school this next year to ask him if they knew about it because uh, of understanding like kids just using it to write their papers and, and stuff like that. Like, oh, wait a minute. We have something else we need to make sure in police. But. Uh, I'm talking too long here, but the one thing, and, th and then I want to get your insights or perspective on some of these things or add to it. But at that conference, they talked about um, over 350 programs out there that people can pay to use AI to specifically do something. And at that conference, they said, like, you don't even do that. You don't even need to do that because you can use chat GDP to just do it for you if you know how to do it. And mm -hmm. I was like, what? So what are your thoughts on all that I just threw at you? Yeah, no, it's 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 all great perspective. And so, you know, speaking of rate of change, what I've heard, and this is sort of a loose um, calculation, if you will, is that about one week's time now with AI, 
is equivalent to about a year's worth of innovation in those other technologies that we saw. So you know, whether it was internet, social media, smartphones, whatever, you know, we were, Apple would be putting out a new smartphone once a year, but entire technologies are rendering, being rendered obsolete every one week, every two weeks or so. And so wow. it's pretty, it's pretty unbelievable. So you gotta, you gotta be careful at, you know, sort of what horse you're betting on because we're literally running a race right now and trying to catch a train that's in mid motion running full speed. Right. And so, um, so, you know, how do you catch that train and have yeah. a second to, 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 to make a decision on, are we going to use this technology or that right now? I think there's a lot of focus on enhancement of existing technologies. Um, later, again, there'll be different phases of this where there'll be complete and other, utter rip outs and replacements of technologies with, you know, AI enhanced um, solutions. And so right now, virtually every piece of software, cloud, you know, uh, SaaS based uh, solution out there is looking to enhance their offerings with AI. That's only going to help us from yes. an efficiency perspective. Um, from a quality perspective, a service perspective, it's only going to help. And, and again, this is the very beginning. We've barely had this uh, in our hands for half a year, <laughs> and, and and it's just been an amazing time. So more more uh, more wild and crazy uh, technology change will be coming up. So you know, it's again, it's both exciting and something to just you know be watchful of um, and, and cautious of. So, in terms of what horse you bet on i think is a is a great analogy and we have been an outcomes based firm you know from day one even though i didn't i definitely didn't know what i was doing the first two years i'm just glad i made it through that but we've definitely been very focused on outcomes but since the pandemic we really added on that next layer of analytics and you know becoming more of a technological firm relevant to ai and video and measuring those outcomes better with analytics. So we're really creating best practices and bringing the most value to our relationships and partnerships. And so when you think about betting on the, the, you know, the right horse, I've heard this kind of said relevant to an executive that, that is tied deeply into the virtual twins world that is, that is evolving and coming. But there's a lot of opportunities out there in, 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 in multiple areas to be transactional, to sell things transactionally, to whatever that is. And so, you know, what I hear you saying in terms of that and what we're talking about is making sure you're you're looking at your outcomes and analyzing and even understanding how well, whether it's a service provider, a partner, um, a, a certain aspect of a, a business unit, really being able to evaluate your ROI on that is going to become more and more important, more and more important because of AI. Yeah, exactly. So I think you hit the nail on the head with outcomes based focus there, right? So what is it we're truly trying to achieve? And then how can we leverage this technology to not only, you know, meet our goals, but surpass those goals? Um, because there is definitely a lot of opportunity to do this. So what I would encourage companies to do is very, um, uh, you know, ASAP, work on training your staff to use these tools now, right? This is just another form of, of employee development. So it helps them, but it helps your firm to help raise the bar and, and, and elevate the level of skill sets and ultimately the output that your existing staff is, 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 uh, is doing. So if you're not doing that, your competitors are going to be doing that. So yes. you're going to be outcompeted if you're not actively working on integrating these tools. So seriously, re, you know, quickly get training uh, for your staff so that they can start getting smarter and, and implement some of these tools in their day-to-day -day life. You know, I know one of the things that you and I had talked about was um, how to start, you know, uh, implementing these with, in conjunction with the internet of things, IOT, mm -hmm. manufacturing and supply chain. Those are my wheelhouse areas, if you will. So leveraging AI and being able to rapidly scrub big data sets to help you to more rapidly make, uh, you know, uh, rapid decisions on driving efficiency across your distribution center, across your manufacturing floor, um, 
again, as I had mentioned, all this AI technology is being uh, looked at and being integrated into you know, your ERP systems, whether you have SAP, Oracle, uh, things like this. If you're using Tableau to start crunching large data sets, AI is being integrated into that by SAP right now so that you can actually make smarter decisions far and, and in just a fraction of the time. And so this is the type of thing that we need to be ready for in, 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 in short order. You don't have months, you have you know days and weeks type of thing. I think you're so right. And it's, it's in terms of how quickly you analyze that data for people that aren't doing that, you're doing it you know, the old way, there's so many different analogies you could use, right? So the, the horse and buggy, uh, the, then, then, then the car, right? So if you're not doing that, not only are you not going to be able to react efficiently or make adjustments where needed, you won't even know that you need to. Mm. You won't even yeah, know you're just, how you're, you're bleeding just that problem. Right. Yeah, and you're just going to get passed by your competitors. And so, um, you know, the larger companies, the more sophisticated companies are already looking at this at, at all sorts of levels. Um, but we can always do more. We can always broaden how we're looking at this. And as the technology rapidly changes, uh, which it is rapidly changing, you know, it's going to start integrating and, and, and imp impacting other things. So you started mentioning things like, um, augmented reality, virtual reality, so AR, VR, uh, mm -hmm. and integrating AI into that. So a lot of med tech companies, for example, are using AR, VR for training, right? So virtual training and things like that, getting your hands on the device, using it on virtual patients and things like this. Now AI is going to be integrated into that, and it's going to just accelerate, uh, again, the rate of change and the uptake of some of this te technology. So again, both an exciting time and a time to uh, to really think about what horse you really want to bet on here. I know at uh, LSI Emerging MedTech with there were nine robotic surgical uh, presentations there for different companies and one of them completely virtual, but just even in, in terms of uh, one of the companies doing education in, in terms of virtual for physicians to get more training before actually working or doing that, whatever that functional thing is on a patient. Mm -hmm. But when you think about surgical access and uh, countries where there's not enough access that can be, you know, life threatening, uh, but being able to have somebody that maybe they're only two years out of residency doing surgeries, but has the access in a sense to a physician skill relevant to AI and being able to practice that's done a thousand surgeries, right? Or 10,000 sure. surgeries. I think obviously from a, um, an outcome standpoint, that could be huge for all of us. Um, so let's, let's uh, kind of, uh, one of the things you and I have talked about recently and with supply chain, everybody knows that supply chain, obviously the pandemic is affected in multiple, uh, in multiple ways and it's hard to get materials, it's hard to get supplies, uh, it is affected us in multiple areas and certainly has affected companies in their thought process on where they get their supply chain from internationally. Uh, those unwinding some of those things, depending on where it, it doesn't happen overnight, but at the mm -hmm. same time, as they look at making adjustments, changing uh, where they're going to be, even in, you know, hey, if I'm over in Europe, if I'm over in the Far East, but I'm a U.S. A company or North American company, hey, maybe I better look at where I get my my uh, product or I manufacture here on this continent versus another one in terms of cost, efficiency, et cetera. So certainly what's been going on with Russia and Ukraine, uh, international scenarios. Uh, the the China-Taiwan tensions have certainly been on everybody's mind. And you and I had a recent, you know, sort of sidebar conversation about that. So maybe you could share some insight on, you know, what would be important for people to know uh, or potentially do, depending on what happens there. Yeah. So specifically um, with regard to China-Taiwan, obviously, 
God forbid that there ever be, uh, you know, a situation, a conflict right. that actually arises there, first and foremost. Um, but if there were, you don't want to wait, first of all, for that to happen. You need to start planning ahead of time, right? So be strategic here. So the first thing that we've been doing is really doing a deep, deep dive and analysis of our level of risk in that region. Now, there's a couple of things. First of all, the easy thing to do is look at your tier one suppliers, right? Everybody knows their tier one suppliers. That's the easy thing to do. But really, you need to go deeper because they're being supplied by your tier two, even tier three suppliers. And especially if you have any sort of an electronic device of any kind, capital equipment or what have you, I can guarantee by the time you're into tier two or definitely by tier three, you have suppliers that are in China and or Taiwan. So you really need to deep dive into your level of risk and then adjust your safety stocks accordingly. And what that you know, will mean is if you're identifying a certain amount of risk, you're gonna to need to increase that inventory uh, strategically in order to offset that level of risk. But you need to deep dive first of all and understand your tier one, tier two, tier three suppliers, what that level of risk is. So that's the first thing. The second thing, um, and I've had this conversation with a number of people. They say, oh, I don't need to worry about it because I'm in Vietnam or I'm in Indonesia or Malaysia or Singapore. And my first thought in, in, in these conversations go, do not necessarily think you're safe if you're manufacturing or being supplied out of Singapore, Malaysia, Vietnam or Indonesia. The reason is that if a conflict were to break out, shipping lanes in this entire theater, in this entire region, are likely to be disrupted or really shut down entirely. And, and again, this will be decided by the military at that point if there were really a conflict. Mm -hmm. um, other folks will say, well, no problem. I'll just fly my product out of there. Well, guess what? In a military conflict, no fly zones will be set up everywhere in that region. So it won't be necessarily easy to just fly your product out of there either. So again, the point here is don't necessarily think you're safe if you're in an adjacent country to China or Taiwan. So what do you do? So the thing to do is to really think strongly about nearshoring some of your manufacturing and specifically to countries that have favorable trade agreements with the United States. A couple that come you know, top of mind are Mexico, Costa Rica, you know, a lot of med tech companies, biotech companies are, you know, have strongholds and, and footholds in some of these com uh, countries, but not everyone does. Actually, a lot of mid-tier uh, companies don't have any sort of presence there, right? But they may have a large presence in China or Taiwan, um, Japan or other places in, in that um, Far Eastern theater. So start looking at nearshoring. Now, I can tell you right now, no supplier likes to be a backup supplier. So right. what you strategically want to think about doing is giving 50%, maybe even more of your volume in order to set up this nearshoring supply chain to a more local supplier. Again, maybe Mexico, Costa Rica, what have you. So start setting that up, start getting some volume from them with the potential of expanding it to become your main supplier and potentially 100% of your supply if there were a conflict. So really nearshoring is, is really very important. That does not happen overnight. This is why you need to start looking at this and planning for this right now. Uh, that's the second thing. The third thing is to, and this sort of takes that to a whole nother level, is to strongly consider vertical integration. So, you know, long story short, producing your product yourself. A um, couple of huge benefits here, and, and, and there's one major cost to this. Big benefits, this massively increases your visibility and your control over your own supply chain, obviously, right? right? You're producing it yourself. But the margin that you'd be paying to a supplier, you're putting it in your own pocket. So this increases your, your profitability. And so companies that are, you know, that have embraced vertical integration typically are far more, far more profitable than those that are outsourcing all over the place, right? And so you're controlling the narrative, you're taking that and putting in your own pocket. Now, of course, this all comes at a cost of capital to invest to actually do this, right? To set right. up these processes and things like that. But if you want to actually take more control, be long-term more profitable in your business, it might be worth allocating the capital 
and actually investing in vertical integration. So these are the three you know, key areas that most of the businesses that I'm speaking with are looking at. Uh, and again, plan now, not when it's too late. That is, that's a really fantastic uh, synopsis. I, re I really appreciate you kind of walking through that and sharing that. And I think the, the, the couple of immediate things that came to mind as you were going through that you know, that sort of cadence of the one, two, three is also understanding that, and the MDR as an example, kind of MDD to MDR kind of popped into my mind, but those that wait too long or it doesn't matter. And as you said, I mean, hopefully it's a conversation that is, is becomes irrelevant. Um, at the same time, uh, being proactive and for those that don't think about it that way, and then try to get in too late, like your, your leverage and ability if, if companies are already ahead of you um, is certainly diluted. And the reason why I mentioned, you know, the MDR, like the MDR just gave another extension, extension relevant to uh, 2027. And I had a conversation with a regulatory uh, SME that I'm friends with and has a ton of experience there. And, and even with that was like, it's fool's gold because what they, a lot of people are stopping their process or putting that on the back burner, thinking they have like, oh, well, that's a long time away. Like, no, it's actually next year during the summer. You have to, you know, I think it's July or August. You have to have your governing your your uh, governing body, you know, signed up. You have to have certain things already in play. And there again, there's going to be people just like they did in that situation that that waited too long, and they're kind of lucky because of the extension, but. Um, and then secondly, yes, inv investing in whether it's property or leasing, uh, investing in capital equipment, uh, that is certainly a, a long game, right? That is a delayed gratification relevant to your profitability and the ROI, but at the same time, being able to control that or having a plan where maybe you do contract manufacturing, but then you have a plan to con you know slowly convert that over, uh, certainly things to, th to think about. And uh, so appreciate you kind of sharing yeah. that thought actually, process. One, one more thing I'd like to add. So many companies that have actually started doing this and going into Mexico and what have you are actually finding that the labor rates, depending on the area, depending on your industry, that the labor rates in many cases in Mexico or even Costa Rica are sometimes less than in China. So the, really? the labor rates in China have been equilibrating over the last decade or more so meaning they've been coming up to kind of match other regions of the world right so they've been getting more expensive and you got to pay for all that transportation from across the world all right. the logistics of that all the inventory that's you know in process inventory that you need to have on cargo ships and things like this that you would not necessarily have to have or manage if you are far closer and near shore here so, um, and again, many cases, the labor rates, which have been one of the main reasons why co uh, companies have gone to China, yeah. the labor rates are actually starting to get a little bit cheaper in Mexico. So definitely something to be thinking at. And if you, and then when you think about the, uh, the fact that, you know, using a supplier, you're still responsible for the quality of, of that product and, and the risk. So you still got to do audits. You still got to look at uh, how their quality management system is set up. So from an efficiency standpoint, you have to go over there and logistics and the cost to go over to the other side of the world versus uh, in a, on a more local, uh, you got to factor that in too. So that's a great point. Well, let's, let's finish up this conversation. Uh, again, I really appreciate your time, but I think something that's kind of near and dear to both our hearts, when you think about, uh, you've got to put the, understand what you need somebody to do in a position and, and have the right skills, right? Uh, that doesn't matter if you don't have the right attitude and cultural fit, but people want to know uh, where their opportunity is for growth. Uh, to get top talent, you can't just think transactionally relevant to right now. And this ties in directly to, to retention. And mm -hmm. so I mentioned in the Greenlight Guru in this section that we were going to be having uh, this podcast coming up, but something that I, uh, you're passionate about as well, and not only passionate about, but have helped companies implement to their benefit is what you call advanced career ladders. And uh, I, I believe you specifically call it the, the quadruple win. But, you know, why don't you tell us uh, in your words kind of what they are and why they can be a secret weapon 
to lowering attrition and improving performance uh, relative to employee development and retention? Yeah, no, it's a great question. And so, listen, we're all in a battle for labor right now, right? With the, the way the labor markets are, the way the economy is, we're all in a battle for labor. So if I told you I had a solution, a process that uh, virtually any company could implement that would both increase the performance level of your company, but also decrease attrition, which is also increasing engagement of your staff, and they love it, would you be interested? <laughs> well, listen, I've impl implemented this in a handful of companies and it has been a game changer. And, and again, we, I call it advanced career ladders. It's, it's different by the way than career pathing. Mm -hmm. Career pathing is more of, you know, if you're a manager, you're gonna go to director and then VP someday. It's not that. What this is, and, and you mentioned quadruple win, it really is, it's, it's, it's always been a win for our clients, our customers, win for the company, a win for the leadership and a win for the staff. So let me explain. So what you're essentially doing is you're laying out a roadmap on how to get ahead in your company. And the way that you do this is typically you publish a tool uh, called an advanced career ladder, and you're defining for every major um, a level within the organization, a measurable expectation for each of those levels in the organization. They're typically defined around leadership competencies, sometimes core competencies, but often, most often around leadership competencies within your company. So hopefully you have leadership competencies within your firm, uh, most do. And so when you have these leadership competencies, you start looking at, okay, so what would we expect, for example, a manager to have output for each one of these core competencies? You go through a defining process, which is actually the most important part of this entire rollout. And what I like to do, here's a little bit of a secret weapon, is I like to ask, for this core competency, what's typical for, let's just say, a manager to have as an output? And someone will say, it'll be, you know, let's, let's pick um, continuous improvement, okay, as your core competency. And they may say, hey, every manager is expected to deliver $50,000 of cost savings every year. Great. Well, would it be reasonable to expect 100,000? What if we help to develop them more? Mm -hmm. uh, could they get to 100,000? Well, you know, that might be reasonable. Okay, great. And we do this by raising the bar of expectations for every leadership competency across every level of the organization. And what you're essentially doing is raising the bar and raising the performance level of the entire enterprise from this one tool, okay? And so you, you build out this tool, it looks kind of like a ladder, like I said, and it, it, it achieves a number of, of wins for the company. So when uh, employees are knocking on your door asking for a promotion, and you say, okay, well, let's pull out our advanced career ladder. Let's take a look. Let's start with your current level. Are you checking all the boxes here that you would need to to be truly smashing it out of the park at your current level? And you might find, oh, there's maybe an area of weakness or two. That becomes a development plan, right? So this drives your development plan. Uh, this might be a conversation you might have during performance review season, right? And by having a tool that's standardized, across the company, it now has standardized your performance management, okay? Um, but the reactions that I've gotten from staff have been unbelievable. And typically we do one of these ladders for um, exempt staff as well as non-exempt staff. And actually they tend to be more successful with non-exempt or hourly staff. Um, oftentimes we'll, we'll put pay ranges tied to each of the levels right on there. That becomes a huge, uh, motivator for folks. And they say, well, I want to get to that level. What does it take? Well, it, the roadmap is all defined and laid out. And so the reactions that I get from staff are unbelievable. They say, I've never worked in a company that is this uh, invested in my development, in my growth, in my advancement, right? And so they love it. So the staff loves it. You're laying out a path for them to be as successful as they possibly can be. Mm -hmm. So the, where, where I've implemented this, I have seen attrition levels reduced by between 40 and 70% within the organization because people say, well, you, know, you actually care. And you know what? We do care. 
We want them to succeed. We want them to all be competing, if you will, to try to go up levels within the organization, have their levels of output just get better and better. This is good for them and it's good for the enterprise. And so these advanced career ladders, I, I, you know, like I said, quadruple win. Everybody wins in this scenario, um, increases the level of performance of the organization, helps with attrition. And to be honest, it's just the right thing to do. So. Um, so yeah, so I don't know if you have any questions on that, but it's something that that's is, near and dear to my heart. I put this together and it, be, it became a best practice. Um, I had smashed a couple of uh, uh, tools together that you know came from my Johnson & Johnson days, my Boston Scientific days and, and others put this together and it's been um, just a home run where it's been implemented. First, first of all, and I got an idea I'll throw at you here, here, here in a minute, but heck no, like I think we could talk about the whole podcast on this and First of all, I love your passion and everything you're saying is so smart, so right. And I believe I don't every single company's number one asset is its people. But it's not it's not just people, because if it's just people, it might not be. It's the right people in the right seat that mm -hmm. fit, that have the right attitude and fit your culture. And what you just talked about is creating an infrastructure within the company that helps the the, the company at its base grow, which is going to be better, as you said, for it's the, the, the clients they interact with. And I just look at in terms of what we do and how we're starting to, to grow and hopefully bring more value uh, is we're actually helping companies establish the, their interview processes because so many interview processes don't do a good job of differentiating between technical aptitude in whatever functional area you're talking about, how you evaluate, gather that information to compare and contrast the skill and separate that from the cultural fit. It's really mm -hmm. important, relevant. You first have to establish what your values are that you want to identify on the cultural side. And then even how you set up the interview questions is there's a whole different thing to that. And then the last thing I would just say is that you know, the, the the more seasoned I get, we'll call it that, right? As 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 I mature in my life, um, the more proactive and the more versus transactional. And I say that having, a, you know, a lot of early in getting out of school and working in the burn unit and critical care, uh, you have to be able to, to react to certain situations and higher pressure situations in the right way. So that's in a sense reactionary. But to get good at that, you got to train on it proactively so that you know how to respond in that situation. But the more transactional you look at, whether it's how you hire people, how you train, I mean, training and development, like you just talked about a process for people to understand how they can not only improve, but but benefit from that with better pay or or, or potentially a promotion. And sometimes people don't want to be promoted. I don't want to manage other people. I'm really good at this, but how can I still grow, be better, be rewarded? And so I think that's so smart. And um, so we've done 19 webinars up to this point. And then we had sort of a, a slowdown last year. We sort of rebooted, thought about some things, how to do things more efficiently. And that's <laughs> kind of what led us to, to us launching the podcast, which has been fantastic. We have three new webinars that are in the process of being set up. But I think I think we should set up a, a, a webinar just on this topic and see about uh, having maybe some uh, some HRTA executives, uh, maybe a three person panel, you and two others, if that's something you'd consider. And I think that could bring great value uh, to to the to the industry. Yeah, no, I, I appreciate that. And it, this is like one of those tools. It, it's sort of like a, a cure for a lot of ills within many, many businesses that you know, I just want to help folks. And I've seen this you know, advanced career ladder tool be so effective and so helpful that you know, it, it would be malpractice if I didn't share it, <laughs> right? And so, and so I want others to be able to implement this if it makes sense for you. Um, but you know, this is going to help your people, help your company, and, and just help your business to succeed. Uh, and again, it's just the right thing to do. So, um, so yeah, I'd be happy to do that. Okay, well, let's get that in writing. Whoever's you know <laughs> publishing it. So that is, and even thinking about you know our company here, we're coming up on our eight-year anniversary, and we say 
having a startup is like trying to sprint with your pants down. It's not, it, it's probably, I've never actually tried that, but that's how mentally I think about it. And um, we don't really have that here. I think we have some, you know, we have, I believe it, people that are here feel we have a great culture, but now I've got a new task. I need to figure out how to implement that here as we continue to grow. So, well, I'm almost sad we're out of time. And I really thank you so much for your willingness to come on, share your experience, your expertise, uh, you know, with our following. Um, I remember the, you know, the day two and a half, three years ago, maybe not the exact day, but the first conversation you and I had and how impressed I was. And um, you've certainly been incredibly impactful at all the companies that you've been with and, uh, you know, have no doubt that uh, you're going to continue to do that in your career. So thanks so much, my friend. I really appreciate you coming on. Yeah, I appreciate it, Darwin. And I want to thank you for what you're doing for the med tech, biotech, med device industries. I mean, you're sharing a lot of knowledge, expertise, helping folks out uh, and making a big impact for a lot of businesses. So I want to thank you for that. Uh, well, thank you. I mean, we're all better together, right? No matter what the example you look at. So I appreciate your time. Have a great day. All right, you too. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Jeff. Right, Bye-bye. For the video recording of this podcast, along with additional resources, make sure to find us on the web at SureGSolutions.com and follow us on social media and LinkedIn at SureGSolutions.